Good evening, everybody. Fingers crossed. You should be able to see me on your screens and uh, possibly even see my uh, computer screen as well. The homepage for Pitch Hero. You should be able to see that. Fingers crossed also that you can hear me uh, loud and clear uh, coming through your speakers. If you can't hear anything or see anything, please do let me know. There's a question section uh, on your control panel on the right hand side there. And there's also a chat section there. So if you're having any problems seeing us or hearing us tonight, please list it in there and we'll double check everything is set up and working as normal. So that's the introduction. Welcome. Uh, I'm joined by John Oates this evening. John's been with me for the last uh, five Mondays now, where we've been tackling topics uh, about running a sports club, a community sports club, how to make it more successful, attract more people to it, how to uh, retain and recruit more volunteers and look after volunteers, uh, as well as lots of other small topics. We're trying to stay away from technology, which is pitch hero's normal bit, and we're focusing more on the uh, softer aspects, I guess, of running a club, but the, just as important and often overlooked by many people. So this has been a, a bit of a trial. We really enjoyed it. We've had some excellent feedback. We're getting large numbers attending them, so um, we'd welcome more feedback, and we're going to see how we can progress this type of conversation, not just, just between John and myself, but also between other clubs, looking at case studies and, and uh, benchmarks and great examples of what other clubs around the country are doing as well to improve their club, attract more members, retain more volunteers and be more successful. So for the next 45 minutes, we're going to talk about two topics. John's going to lead that and I'm going to ask John some questions. You can fire in your questions at any time. Again, using that question box, if you're listening to something that strikes a chord with you, please do let us know. Add a quick question there. And just before I hand over to John and give it to John, let me bring your attention to what you see now, pitchhero.com. Uh, this is our new website, our new screen. Uh, check it out. It's got everything you need to know about the latest updates to Pitch Hero, uh, what we're doing, what we're bringing to you. There's all the information you need about club website. Uh, and many of you probably will see the new tools that we're selling, the new performance, uh, Pitch Hero GPS, uh, which we hope will be just as accessible as the website. And then finally, uh, a really important part, if you hit more on pitchhero.com, uh, it takes you to this page, which is the Clubhouse, which is a fantastic uh, resource for all volunteers. Lots of information about Pitch Hero, uh, links to book a call with our support team. That's unfortunately not one of our support members, but uh, you can book a call and click there. And also you can scroll down to this new section called Be Volunteer Happy. And within this section, you can see lots of great ideas to reduce our admin, increase revenue, boost fundraising, manage facilities. So if you click on improve communication, you have lots of great ideas here. It tells you the chances of improving, how, how much you can impact your club, how to get started, uh, and lots of other great help. You've also got book a demo. If you want to chat to one of our account managers, they're open, they're desperate for your calls. You've got links to more webinars. I think there's three webinars happening this week. There's a webinar about payments on Wednesday, and there's a webinar about Pixelet, Pixelot, our video camera folks on Thursday. So you can attend more webinars, come to the webinar page. And then there's also the blog, uh, the great blog. We put a lot of time and effort into this blog. It's updated throughout the, the, the week. Lots of great articles here to help you as well. So if you do something this evening, check out pitchhero.com. It's all new, it's all very shiny. Uh, and lots of exciting things there to help you. But we'll come back to this evening and what we're going to talk about. So a big welcome to John. John Oates, 25 years working in community sport, the grassroots. Uh, big welcome, John. What are we uh, What are we talking about this evening? So we're going to look at uh, the, the community or, or some ideas of how you can attract people from the community with a bearing in mind that your competition is also in the community. Uh, so you're going to have to be better than your competition in some instances and how you can attract people from that to join your club or support your club. Um, some some of the bits and pieces have been a trodden path and some of them I hope you find new uh, and you pick up an idea and just take it from there. We're then going to look at a plan. Um, you know, we've got fantastic volunteers working in clubs and a majority of them are, are, are amateurs and therefore when we talk about planning that's a lot of time and those three-year plans it's a lot of work going into that and my sentiment is keep it simple uh, we can utilize the people we've got and we can get outcomes try to do too much and, and we're going to get bogged down we're not going to go anywhere so it's keep it simple and have a simple plan so yeah. moving on to this 
situation of I'm going to make got, you the presenter there, John. You should now be the presenter, and we should all now be able to see John's screen there, interacting with the community. Interacting with the community, yes. So, uh, as we've done in the past, we've got about 10 minutes of, of little highlights, things that we've seen, things that I've seen over 25 years, little little points of best practice you can pick up and utilise. And if you utilise one or two of these little bits of best practice, like within the, the, the volunteering section, we talked about how many clubs now are bringing groups of people in with skills to do projects. They're not using them all year round, but they're starting to say, right, we've got a whole range of skills within our junior section, our members, let's just bring them in for two months to do a project. And little snippets like that. I have done my introduction, I've done many years in, in uh, working in sports, 25 years from professional clubs to community clubs, stealing the ideas. Um, I've been training the individuals who run them, but but I've listened a lot and I've learned an awful lot. And so what I, what I talk about in these five or 10 minutes are not ideas. These are things that people are doing and hopefully a little bit different. So what is the challenge? What do we need to think about if, if we are a community sports club? The first thing we need to think about is the community is our marketplace. That's where a majority of our sponsors, our participants, our business partners, our supporters will come from. So we have to look at the community in which we, we settled in. We have to analyze the community um, and see who lives there, what type of people live there, how can we attract them to our club, the different types of people that are there. We also have to say this is really important that our competition also sits in the community. If they are more active than us in attracting people to their club and selling people for their club, they're more proactive in selling things to sponsors, they will get the sponsors. So you can't sit back and say, oh, who comes will come. If we want to be competitive, we have to realize that there is competition that we have to consider. Therefore, what do we need to do? We need to promote our clubs within the community. We have to be visible within the community. We have to push people to know that we exist, what we do, how good we are, the image that they have of us. We have to build that, and it's pretty simple. We don't have to go into great depths of promotion, simple promotion, but high quality promotion, even of our people going out and being advocates is good enough as a starting point. And as I say, we also have to understand that we are, our communities are diverse and the demographics are different. And so we have to give some thought to the people that live there and will they be interested in what we have to sell? So how is the, um, the club viewed by the community? How can we get a great image of ourselves? Well, the first thing is um, our logo. Our logo is part of our brand, or let's call it our image. Our image is the personality of our club. It's how people understand us. We have to have a strong logo. If we have a strong logo, people will recognize it and therefore they'll adhere to us and they may come back to us because of knowing who we are and that they see some of the young children, perhaps playing in the yards, perhaps playing in the fields. And if they have that logo on, they'll recognize that we are a club. Secondly, the reputation of our club is really important. If we say we are a family club, then the reputation is built of by being a family club, by people welcoming families as they arrive on the first phone call, that first phone call, hello, how are you? How can I help you? That's our reputation. And that will go through the community as well. And I say the values of the club, caring for people. Are we honest? Are we very uh, interested in looking after friends, family? Those things will create an image within the community which will attract people. Now, in, in essence, it is firstly the strong logo. Is it the same in all settings? Some clubs that go to it varies. We need to have a strong logo that's the same in all settings. Does the club deliver what it promises? If we attract 10 new families to the club and we say we are family friendly, your children will meet friends. As adults, there'll be a social evening for you. If those things happen, they'll be happy. If they don't, we haven't done what we promised and we'll lose our reputation. 
there needs to be an ethos that everybody in the club buys into. We talk about in the major clubs, the professional clubs, it's exactly the same. They have a culture that everybody buys into. In our clubs, however small they are, my club, we've got eight or ten people coaching in the junior section. We all need to, if you like, be in a boat pulling in the same direction. However, in some clubs, we have eight or ten people pulling in one direction while one person's punching a hole into that boat. We need everybody on board for our culture. As I said, we need to be visible in the community. Signage at the club, so simple. The signage at the club, at the entrance to the club, wherever it is, needs to be strong. Our website, now we're going to talk more about this next week, but as you know, it's a simple thing. The website's there, all open all of the time. And if I arrive into a, a new community and I want to find out something about the club, I'll go to the website. The image that the website portrays is the image I will have of the club. So it might be, I have a family and I have a business. And if I go to the website and it's not strong, I look at another club and we've lost somebody in business and somebody who has a family. Communication. Now, nowadays, there's so many different types of communication through social media, through email marketing and through word of mouth and through posters. We just need to know who are we communicating and which channel we're using to get through to them. Last week, we talked about community and one of the comments was that the, the club, uh, one of the presidents of the club said, I want this to be in the newspaper. And somebody said, why? He said, because the people of my age only read a newspaper. They don't have social media. They don't do email marketing. And that's true. If we've got a whole rake of people who are perhaps over 65 or 70 who are really strong in the club, they may only read the newspaper, which is why, as one thing, we need to make sure there's information in it. Supporting your community. This struck me between the eyes when I, I used to work a not for the IRFU with all of their clubs. And I went to Killarney. And one chap said something to me. I said, how do you work with the community? He says, I have a philosophy. He says, the more I do to support my community, the more they support me. I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, it's a funny thing, but if we go to all the sportsmen's dinner from the other clubs, if we helped to steward the carnival, if we helped in community um, events and let them come onto our ground, do you know what? The more people have heard of us and the more people support us. So, can you share for your facilities? Can you share your manpower? Can you support community events? Because you will get the money back with an interest from the people. Partnerships, yes, are obvious. Can you, can you get partnerships with schools, with community networks and councils? A lot of us try to get a development officer. I have with my club. We've just got going to get a development officer, a full-time person that we've raised the funds for because we see it's so important, who's going to go into the schools for us and build the image and bring people to our club. The final little section is I'm an absolute fanatic about events. Now, if I talk to many people, events to me are a fantastic way of you building a relationship with your community. It is in the, if I go to some clubs, it's an income generator for members of the club. So they have a president's night, a chairman's night, a captain's night, a captain chairman chairman's night, a captain chairman's President's Night, the best clubs say, right, events aren't just about raising money. They're about attracting new people into the club from the community. They're about building our reputation. So whenever you are running an event, you have to say to yourself, why am I running this event? And what is the outcome of the event? It might be that you just want to promote the facilities to the people in the community if you have facilities. But having said that, I go to some clubs where they don't run their events in their clubhouse if they have one. They run it in a hotel. Why? Because the image of what they're doing is completely different to the clubhouse. They believe that some new people may say, oh, we're not going to the rugby club or the football club or the cricket club. It's a, it's a sports club. But if you say we're going to a hotel for an event, oh, that's completely different. So consider where you run events is another little thought about where you should do it and can you build your reputation in the community when you do run those events 
running events, how many are there? Well, <clears throat> there's tons to do. So what are the steps you do? First of all, the workforce. Collect. My view is on events in my club now, we collect together a group of skilled people. The last one we did was a, a sportsmen and women dinner. We had someone who was a hotelier who, who did the food. We had someone who worked in sound to do the sound. We had somebody in marketing who did the ticketing. We only met six times, but we had skilled people. They only met for two months before, and we had a great event because we just collect, collected together a group of people to run it, not the normal people who do fantastic work all year round. Where do you run the events? I've talked about that. You need to decide what's it for and what are the outcomes. Uh, out in our instance, we were trying to generate income in that last event, but also to introduce we introduced some potential members, some potential sponsors, and we brought them both along and had a table or two of people that we funded to be there, and we got the money back. Who are we targeting and how, and then deliver it. So just to finish off, look, simple events, we all know what they are. The simple events from race nights, Burns evenings, open mic nights, president's nights, pre-match lunch. However, I have seen, and I'm quite interested in Ireland, the uh, sportsmen and women events, the strictly, a lot of Strictly Come Dancing uh, events. This is a massive event. Now, what's quite interesting about this is that the people, the people who, who run it, go to 10 or 15 or 20 businesses and clubs around, and they put in a couple of people to train. Now, on the evening, there's 10 or 15 people from different clubs and businesses with people come to support. And it's a great night. And there's training done for the couples. And there's betting and there's food. Really good to work with in the community. So Oktoberfest, I've seen white collar boxing, business lunch with speaker, all of these you'd be totally aware of. But these are slightly bigger and can have other outcomes for you. So in in, in summary, what we're talking about, you must work with your community to build an image within your community, and it forms a pathway between you and the community. Once you do that, really effective in terms of building your membership, sponsorship, et cetera. And those are some of the, some of the highlights of what we've been talking about. That's great, John. You should be able to hear me now. Sorry, my line broke up a bit, so I switched off my video camera, but you can hear me now. and clear there, John. We'll keep going. Uh, I can't see you, so I will just uh, I will just put a yeah. screen up there in case anyone sees us and uh, just for, for, for when we move forward. There you go. I'm back here now, John. So I've turned my video off, but you should be able to hear me nice and clear. I can, absolutely, um, yes. Right, that was a great presentation. Thanks for that. A couple of scribbles that I put down here, getting known in the community and putting yourself out there. I would imagine most of the Pitch Hero clubs, their clubhouses can be closed for most days during the week, Monday to Friday, nine till five o'clock, that clubhouse door closes and it, not many people use. That's a great opportunity to offer that to community groups, whether that's toddler groups, or young mums, you have future players, future club members, or for all the retired people to do dancing or something like that, which can get your, your name out there and get people talking about your venue in the community. There must be a huge number of venues that are just untapped throughout the week. Yeah, uh, you know, you can you can sweat those assets. Uh, we talked about only this last week with um, Book Tech. I think that the, yeah. the, the, they're the people who can book your, uh, your facility for you. The advantage, if you have your own clubhouse, the advantages are huge because you have great parking, and that's what a lot of people look for. You have space, and that's what a lot of people look for. You're usually easy to find. You're friendly because rugby, football, sport is generally a friendly, uh, a friendly group of people. And if you, um, if it's a business and you put some business uh, technology in there, perfect, perfect. So yes, the facilities can be used locally uh, for community events, be it um, sadly funerals, uh, birthdays, or um, just parties, uh, or for business where, as I say, the, the advantages are huge. Yeah, and there's also a lot of community groups that perhaps don't have any facilities, but they might not want to use you. So 
um, you know, you could reach out to them for their annual meetings or their annual Christmas events, cycling clubs I'm thinking of, or running clubs that perhaps don't have their own clubhouses. You can provide it for them. Again, gets your name out and gets you helping out other clubs. Another one that I think always uh, is somehow forgotten, but is signage. How many clubs don't have great signage? You drive past them, they don't have a really good signage up with their sponsors or, or information about the next game. You know, I always love a club you go past and it has this Saturday, we're playing so-and-so, kickoffs at so-and-so. I, I bet one in 10, maybe 20% of clubs do that, but it's very effective. Oh, absolutely. And and what I've seen now is a, there are companies out there that if you they'll help you get planning permission for digital signage and then they can put adver advertisers on it and you can generate an income. It'll cost you nothing. Um, mm. But also you can put information about what you're what you're doing and the events that you run. There's many clubs I've been to. I remember I went into a football club. Uh, I won't mention where it was in, in Wales. And there's a, when I was there, somebody came in and said, I just live across over there, just the back road. I didn't know you existed here. So, or, or that you did these sort of yeah. parties. So having information on, on the, um, by the road about ex exactly what you do, A, is hugely beneficial, but B, if there's a lot of traffic, and you, and you can work with these companies out there. You can get digital signs that can earn you some cash. Yeah, yeah. I know some teams have put sandwich boards on payments if they're playing, you know, in the in the park pictures and things like that. They'll put sandwich boards out as well with information for new members and websites and where to go. Last one on this, we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, which was uh, a club, a football club, where they had a minibus that takes the players to games and training. When that's not used, they give it to the community for free. And during COVID, they were transporting people around. They were uh, moving food bank foods around. They had their club branding all down the side of it. And that's a fantastic, you know, uh, it's an investment for the club that's not being used, put to great use in the community Monday to Friday. Absolutely. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Okay, that's the first one there, folks. Uh, I'm just looking at one of the first questions that's come through. This this webinar, just to let you know, will be recorded and it'll be available and you'll get it in your email inbox, links to it uh, in the next 24 hours. There's a go to your webinar, I have a page for us where they put all of our past webinars on and I'll send you a link to that shortly after this. So, John, we're still sharing your screen. Uh, if you want to start the next presentation now, which is all about uh, realistic and deliverable planning. Yes, and again, this is something that really interests me because um, it, in, in community sports clubs, we have uh, fantastic volunteers who perhaps don't have uh, all the experience that business, well, they don't have the all the experience that the businesses do about planning, and uh, they don't have the experience of building a strategy. And, you know, some of them go away and build two, three-year plans, and to me, it seems to be, it's too complicated to do too complicated and my view is that you need to keep it very simple your planning and it needs to be realistic and you need to be able to deliver it so in in the background in common with any business our, our sports club our sports club uh, is a small business actually and therefore because we do uh, need to grow numbers so we do need to sell things we do have people who spend money with us and therefore they are if you like customers and we do have to give them a good experience Therefore, they will stay with us. And that's, if you like, customer experience. But it's much simpler than that. We need to keep it simpler than that. So we need, but we do need to think about how important the planning is. So it could be simply, planning could be simply that the leader, and that's usually the leader or the, the leader of the volunteers who, who organizes the, um, the planning, says, right, next year, well, we're going to start our membership campaign um in month x and we're going to do a, a start our sponsorship campaign in, in in year y and we want to earn this amount of money from sponsorship and this amount from sp membership keep it simple keep it simple it could be that um however that there's there's an internal or an external situation which demands change so covid uh, has demanded a lot of change and the word change is really important and, and leaders of clubs have been working really hard to keep sustainable, keep their clubs sustainable because of COVID. It could also be internal that we have an unexpected drop in membership and something has to change in what we do. So in the first instance, the plan is we just keep on doing what we're doing, but we give ourselves little targets around membership, let's say, or sponsorship. 
The second type of planning we need is when we need to change something because something's not working. And it's usually the leader or the leadership group will need to act and, and instigate this change. Why do we need to plan? Well, we need to plan because without a plan of who's doing what and when and what the outcomes are, we can lose opportunities, totally lose the opportunity to, to have a benefit. We can lose resources that can be wasted if everybody doesn't work in the same direction, if everybody doesn't understand what we're trying to achieve. So without a plan, opportunities can be missed and, and resources can be totally wasted. Without a plan, um, we have people rowing in different directions, as I mentioned. So we have some people going off in the left, to the left, some people going off to the right. And what this does is undermine the culture or the good feeling or the strength of feeling within the club. So it can lead to frustration or failure. So a plan, however simple it is, is really important. I'm going to give you a, a structure of a plan in a minute. Deciding to make the changes, so as we've mentioned, could be external factors. It could be internal factors. It could be membership, family membership, income from sponsorship. Now, proactive clubs, I see some proactive clubs who what they do, and, and again, they try to keep it as simple as possible. They only might take them about an hour because it's back of a fag packet sort of looking at what's happening. And they take each of the main factors within the club. It could be communication, membership, sponsorship, participants, club, uh, bar, events. And they, first of all, look at what they've done over the last three years and what they're doing this year. Now, that immediately will show if there's been a drop in income. And in order to try and work out why that dropped, they do a SWOT analysis. Now, many of you will have done a SWOT analysis, which is what is the strengths of what we're doing? What's the weaknesses of what we're doing? What are the opportunities of what we're doing, which are external to the club? And what are the threats? So what I mean by that is if, if I looked at uh, my club and we looked at last three years, wow, the membership has really dropped. So we'd say, right, in terms of membership, what are our strengths? Well, our strengths might be mm, uh, that we've, we've got a great catchment area to grow our club from, um, and we've got some uh, great benefits, if you remember. What's the threats? What are the negatives? We've got nobody running it. We have nobody, no group who are in charge of it. So that's a threat to us. We need to change that. It might be that competition has come in with another club. Wow, so we've got to address that and say, well, we've got to change something. You've got to be better than the other club. The opportunity might be that the club has, has closed down or, or moved away, and the threat might be COVID or it might be economic climate. So very simply, our group get together, they look at in every main aspect of the club. This is really simple. They look at numbers to see what's happened over the last few years. If something's not working, they then do the SWOT analysis to try and understand why it's not working. And then they change and they have to make a plan. This, as I say, will change how to make a plan. Now, undoubtedly, the best way that any club can do it is by, and you'll all, many of you will come across this, using something that's called a SMART process. So whenever we make a plan, it has to be specific. We want to, uh, we it might say, right, do we, we want, some people might say, if it's not specific, non-specific is we want to generate more income. Specific is we want to grow our membership income as one of the income streams. Measurable is we have a measure on it. So we want to grow our income, but we want to grow it by 50%. Attainable, do we have the resources and the skills to achieve this? So if you don't, there's no point in starting to try and get 50% more sponsorship if you do not have the people who are going to do it or you're not in an area where that is possible. Is it relevant? Do we want? Does that fit in with the club's ethos? Do we want to raise more money from sponsorship or are we better growing it from getting more members? And it needs to be time-framed. So as an example, I might say, right, an example, we want to attract more families to the club. Okay, specific. We want to grow the junior section. We want to grow it by 15 new families. 
we have a group who will work on this and we have coaches who'll deliver this and we have the links into the community so far so good it is relevant yes we're a family orientated club so everyone in the club is going to be able to support us by welcoming people and let's do it for the next season so we've got a very simple smart plan there that tells us very simply we're going to grow our junior section by 15 new families we know it's possible we know how people to do it and we're a family orientated club therefore it's viable what wouldn't be very smart would be i want to grow the club by attracting another 34 senior members to it no we don't have the coaches yet but we think we might get them is it relevant no because we don't we don't want to have another three senior 15s because we don't at this stage have enough fields to for them to play on and we don't have enough resources at this stage and if it's time frame so you have to if you're going to have a smart plan it has to be achievable so the workforce i've said group of volunteers always works well everybody has to know what they're doing and when so the plan is simple Johnny is starting to build the marketing material and have it ready by month two. Tommy has got the coaches ready and he knows they'll be ready. Bobby knows he's going to get a uh, marketing materials and everything ready to go out to the schools. All work together, all know what the job is, and then step by step, they deliver it. So the information goes out to the schools, goes out into social media, goes out into the community, people are attracted to come to a meeting. When they come to the meeting, they're told about the welcome, they're told about the junior section, and then they're moved on to joining the junior section where the coaches are there, where the ethos is there, and where everything is delivered. But this is led by the leader. The leader or designated, somebody designated by the leader who will be a democratic leader, as we say, in sports clubs because he'll work with everybody together will have to lead and monitor it and if it's working fantastic so finishing off yeah creating a three-year plan is difficult my view is you might be better off to create a simple vision which says that by 2023 we'll want to be a family orientated club with a hundred involved our first 15 were promoted in the clubhouse the extension will be completed very simple and then we know there are four or five of those simple smart plans that have to be done keep it simple in order to get to that vision or where you want to be but just keep it simple and don't try too much so in summary we are we are you are volunteers who look after the health mental health physical health a fantastic number of people in order to be sustainable your club do not waste time without a plan but the plan needs to be simple if it's too complicated people will be frustrated time will be wasted resources will be wasted just keep it simple okay that's great thank you very much john um i've got a few questions here and a few points that i put down you're absolutely right about um, the timeline of plans and, and long term planning. It's off putting for everyone. It's a long term plan is off putting in the workplace. You know, when your boss gives you a long term two, three year plan. But if you're a volunteer being faced with a daunting two, three year plan, that's even more off putting. And it really annoys when governing bodies get into a very bad habit of they always do grassroots plans that are four years long because that's how the professional game or the Olympic works or the world rugby works or the, the, the World Cup or the Euros. But actually in grassroots sport, you think in months, don't you? You normally think if it's the winter season, let's get from September to Christmas. And then that's the that's the worst of the weather or, or, the, or, or it gets darker and colder and you come out of Christmas, you have a couple of bad weeks and then it's the spring. And, and you back out. So you almost have two planning stages, the, the, the pre-Christmas season and the post-Christmas season. That's how I always think of the rugby season, the football season anyway, breaking it down. The first part is getting as many kids and many members into your club, focusing on that registration and then keeping them all the way till Christmas. And then as you come out and it starts getting lighter and brighter and warmer, you can start planning some more things. So yeah, timing, you know, short-term plans, short-term projects, I think super important. 
I, I do think that I think it's very important with plans and something that we always try and do at Pitch Hero. In fact, we have a rule that you can't do it without it, is to try and give a numerical number to every plan. So in a grassroots club, you might be saying, we want to increase the number of teams. Well, how many teams? Is it one girl's team? It needs a number, one, two, three. Increase the number of members. How many members? What's the number? Increase the number of volunteers. What's that number? Or it could be increase your revenue as a club. Well, what is that number? And that's really important because then everybody who's part of that planning process knows what the outcome is. They know what success looks like. They know what it's like to reach the end of the plan. So to add a number to that, um, what would you what would be your immediate advice to somebody uh, going into the season right now, a winter season, who's looking to increase um, the number of, of of girls joining their teams? Because this is you know very popular now, obviously way ahead in football, but rugby following cricket as well. Um, uh, what would you what would be what would be your top tips for helping somebody looking to plan to attract perhaps for the first time? to set up a women's team, either senior or junior at the club? Personally, I bring a group of people together who have the range of skills and the connections. So I might have someone who understood schools. If there's a school, someone who works in schools, a teacher, I might bring them in to understand how the communication of those schools will work better one way than another. Then I'd work out exactly what those, I, I would work out what they wanted. Uh, I'd say, right, okay, and we're going to try and get 20 under 13s, 14s, and 15s. So what is it that their parents will want from them to come? So the parents will be bringing most of them. Um, what is it they want? So it would be in, in the need to know it's a safe environment, the need to know that there's good coaching, the need to know it's well organized. So I'd work out what I think they would want. I would then create a very simple plan with my group of people that said, right, we're going to create some marketing which tells them we know what they want. They want to have fun, fitness and friends through this. And we promote it through fun, fitness and friends. We work out the marketing channels to use by using people with perhaps a teacher. How do we best approach a school? What's the best way of doing that? And then I would bring them all together uh, with the parents and introduce perhaps not to get the 14, 15, 16, they all come along themselves, but any younger, bring the parents and tell them what we're going to do. And then I would deliver what we what we promised. That's right. Delivery is the key thing, obviously, delivering what you promise. What do you think is um, the biggest mistakes that people normally make when planning at a grassroots club? Where do you see it? You know, it starts off with great intentions, but it goes off track and you know it's struggle to finish struggle to get to the end struggle to get things done where do you think most most clubs go wrong two things firstly they don't understand they don't consider the skills that are going to be needed to deliver it they just consider the people which is sometimes you've just got the people you've got to do what you can but if you yeah. go back to creating a group of people you might be able to pull skills out to from different from different areas just for two or three months Secondly, they try to do too much. Everybody tries to do too much. Sometimes they've got three campaigns going on at the same time, and there's just not the resources to do it. You, the word in the smart is attainable. <clears throat> Can we achieve this? Is it attainable? Uh, if it's not, don't do it. If it's not, bring it back in. Don't don't yeah. be so ambitious. But yeah, we have to technology. Second. You call it an MVP, a minimal viable product. What can you build yeah. to just get out to test the market? That's going to be the the smallest, smallest thing just to get out first and get that live and add to it. And you, you're off. right. Yeah, and finish off. Uh, clubs, let's finish off. If we aim to get 15 new families and we got 10, fantastic, because those 10 are very valuable. Um, yeah. So. And, and we've achieved something, worked as a team, got a culture, and the next time we do it, we'll be even more efficient. Just don't try and do too much. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Uh, okay, folks, well, we've reached the end of our conversation this evening. Um, it's been great having you here. We hope you've enjoyed it. Like I say, this is all being videoed and be available on email. Um, just before we finish, John, do you have anything else further to add or look ahead to next week? Well, next week, I think we're looking at two, two areas, aren't we? We're looking at um, specifically how the website is absolutely critical 
uh, for any club for five, six, seven, eight reasons. And we're going to look at those reasons why, if you do nothing else, make sure you, your website is really good. And then we're going to pick social media apart a little bit to say, you know, if you don't really understand social media, even if you understand the different channels target different people. Uh, and if I'm trying to run an event, for instance, uh, I might use Facebook in the community. If I'm trying to uh, find some sponsors, I might use LinkedIn and how different social media channels um, can be utilized for different customers. But please be careful <laughs> as you get sucked in and you become busy fools with tons of social media work going on. And I think we're going to try and pick out some of the key points there, Mark, aren't we? We are. Big day for me next week where I best polish off my presentation skills and uh, get it. But you're absolutely right. When someone wants a new club, they're going to ask around. They're going to ask for recommendations from family members. They're going to follow you know, who's doing what, school, etc. But mum and dad are also going to Google it. And so if that website comes up, it looks a million dollars like it can with Pitch Hero. And that's a big step forward. So that's something to look forward to. Same time next Monday. If you've got any feedback from tonight, we'd love to hear it. If you've got any ideas or topics you'd like us to cover, please let us know. We'd love to hear it and add to it. Uh, we're currently bringing all our ideas and feedback together uh, and, and hopefully we'll carry on doing these evening sessions. So that's it for tonight. Thanks very much, John. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, and we'll speak again next week. Good night. Uh, have a good, great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.